Education is what's important. Training, preparation for the expected. Education, preparation for the unexpected. Good afternoon or good evening to the community, depending on where you are. And on behalf of Marine Corps University, the Marine Corps University Foundation, and the Brute Crulak Center for Innovation and Future Warfare, welcome back to the Brutecast, our series designed to connect the worlds of the warfighter and PME with the best in innovative and creative thought. I'm your host, Major Ian Brown, Operations Officer at the Kulak Center. Before we begin, as always, all opinions expressed here are those of the individual and do not necessarily reflect the views of any agency uh, or government entity with which they may be affiliated. So um, our guest today, you've, you've seen her before, you know her name, but she's here in a slightly different capacity than usually uh, she is on Team Kulak. So uh, we're talking to Brigadier General Valerie Jackson, who as, uh, as has been our director at the Kulak Center um, since the center was formed, but was uh, has been deployed for the last few months to combine Joint Task Force Horn of Africa as the Deputy Commanding General. So I was trying to remember, I think the last time we spoke, ma'am, I don't think we gave, gave full credit to your, your military biography. So um, for the benefit of our audience here and for those who are listening afterwards, I'm going to go ahead and, uh, and capture some of that to give them a sense of, you know, this other hat that you've always worn um, as uh, within the, res you know, initially active duty and then in the reserves. Um, as I go through it to the audience, I think this is a pretty good example of kind of the, the variety and diversity of experience that our, our reservist Marines go through in terms of the, the jobs they do and the things they've done. So our General Jackson was commissioned in 1994 and initially trained as a communications officer. She joined Marine Wing Communication Squadron 28 in Cherry Point, North Carolina, serving as wire and radio platoon commander and detachment operations and executive officer. In 1996, she deployed as an embassy liaison officer to Lima, Peru, and then returned to North Carolina in 1997 to Marine Combat Training Battalion School of Infantry East as a company executive officer to assist in female enlisted integration efforts. In 1998, she transitioned to SOI's headquarters and service battalion to serve as Marines awaiting training and headquarters and service company commanders, and finally as headquarters and service battalion executive officer. In July 1999, she transferred to the Marine Corps Reserve, where we, we go through some of those other very interesting tracks here. So uh, in 2003, she became the peacetime wartime support officer in charge for India Company, 3rd Battalion, 23rd Marines in Little Rock, Arkansas. In 2006, she then joined the Marine Corps History Division as the senior editor and a field historian, where she revitalized the division's historical publication, Fortitudini, and covered several theater security cooperation exercises around the globe. She then joined the SCETC Civil Military Operations Branch and assisted in the branch's development of a program of instruction for the first Marine Corps Civil Affairs Military Occupational Specialty School. In 2009, she deployed to Operation Enduring Freedom in support of Marine Expeditionary Brigade Afghanistan. She then joined the 2nd Marine Expeditionary Force as the Civil Military Operations Planner in 2011 before transitioning to 2 MEFs G6 as Reserve Operations Officer. She subsequently served as Marine Forces Reserve Force Headquarters Group G6. From 2013 to 2016, she was Commanding Officer of Marine Wing Communication Squadron 48, supporting both reserve and combatant commander requirements around the globe. In May 2015, she transferred to 8th Marine Corps Recruiting District as a Recruiting Support Officer in Dallas, Texas. And she then commanded the Force Civil Affairs Group in Halea, Florida. Hope I pronounced that somewhat right where she trained her Marines to support global civil military operations requirements. Following her promotion to Brigadier General, she worked as Deputy Director for Information Plans and Strategy at the Deputy Commandant for Information's Office and was then assigned as Deputy Commander Reserve at the 2nd Marine Expeditionary Force in March of 2022. And um, she now serves as Deputy Commanding General for Combined Joint Task Force Horn of Africa, and as I said, has been deployed since January in that capacity. So um, that's quite a... Uh, a lot, a lot of things have led up to uh, this current deployment, um, but I think uh, as we're going to talk about here in a second, uh, those skill sets have probably been proven very useful in the operations for the Combined Joint Task Force. So, ma'am, uh, welcome to the broadcast again, um, and I'll turn it over to you. Hey, thanks, Ian. This is um, this is quite something to be um, in this in this format, you know, overseas and and looking at you from this angle, knowing that I can't just stick my head out of my office and. Uh, and tell people to be quiet because you're recording. Um, so th this is this is really a pleasure to uh, join you uh, from here. Um, it's always uh, humbling 
and, and a little bit embarrassing to hear, um, you know, your your own personal litany of things that you've done. But I think you're right in that it really did prepare me for uh, for this position over here. Um, one thing that I that I did um, that doesn't show up on the bio because I a I haven't updated it and, and b it wasn't for that long. But as director of operations for the Marine Corps up at PPNO this summer, that really set me up well for you know a service level um, look at you know operations over here before actually coming over. So uh, that was that was also very helpful. So. Um, I think to get started, we'll we'll uh, tee off in with good Marine Corps fashion, having uh, some multimedia, um, and then uh, then I'll roll into sort of a little bit of an overview, and then do some Q and A for the folks uh, on the line here. Did you know Africa is three times the size of the U.S. Within the Horn of Africa, bordering Ethiopia, Eritrea, and Somalia, is a country no bigger than the state of New Jersey. That country is Djibouti. Here lies us, the U.S. military's only enduring location in all of Africa, Camp Lemigny, and on it, our headquarters for the Combined Joint Task Force, Horn of Africa. A Combined Joint Task Force is a headquarters with support from multiple countries and multiple U.S. military branches, all working together to accomplish a common goal. As a dynamic operational headquarters in Africa, we work alongside partner nations and coalition forces to achieve a unified effort in East Africa and beyond. We do everything alongside the Department of State and U.S. Agency for International Development, promoting diplomacy and development in the region. Our success in the region stems from our five lines of effort. One, strengthen strategic influence. While keeping our interests in mind, we maintain mutually beneficial relationships in the region by helping our allies and partners. Two, protect U.S. interests. We monitor malign activities taking place throughout the continent and bring awareness to the global audiences. Three, respond to crisis. We are the local 911 for our embassies and personnel across Africa. Four, support allies and partners. We've been at Camp Lemonnier for 20 years, working alongside our partners, such as Djibouti, France, Italy, Spain, South Korea, Japan, and other African countries. Five, enable support and project operations, activities, and investments. We prepare for and assist the fight against terrorist organizations, preventing the threat of attacks against U.S. citizens and the homeland. There are a myriad of challenges facing East Africa, such as climate change leading to drought or violent extremist organizations impacting stability. With these challenges in mind, we're committed to improving the stability, safety, and prosperity of East Africa. Every day, we continue to work with our allies and partners, continuing a rich history of unified efforts in the region. Okay. Hey, so I don't know if everyone uh, caught that at the end, but for, for the Marines on the line that our, our um, emblem should look familiar, uh, especially if you, you served at Camp Lejeune. So and that, that ties in very neatly with uh, what I want to do now is talk about um, our history. So there are a lot of people that come through here uh, and say, Oh, I've I've been to Djibouti before, or you know, I, I was I was part of the the Mew that was offshore. Um, or, you know, I was here five, six years ago and, you know, I kind of, I kind of know, you know, what's going on there. Um, and, and the, the actual fact is that, uh, you, this is not your, not your daddy's combined joint task force. So over the years, it's changed, um, pretty dramatically based on the, you know, the needs of the, the country, the establishment of, of AFRICOM and the, of course, the AOR changing uh, quite dramatically. Um, and so, you know, the Marines came ashore in 2002 uh, and came ashore for good in 2003. Um, and, and that's why when they established the Combined Joint Task Force, it's the shield uh, of the 2nd Marine Division that is at the, uh, at the center of it. Um, it was really a response to 9-11. We, we needed a power projection um, base in this area of the world. And we already had friends here um, in the French and uh, it was a very it was a very uh, strategic place for us to be of course you know one of nine strategic maritime choke points um in the world and um for that reason alone i think you know it it took us a long time to get here 
but now I know it's a place that um, that we can never leave. And when you stand at the water's edge in Djibouti and you kind of look at the uh, the narrow uh, straits, you you can really feel it and understand you know why this is um, why this is key terrain. So. That was 2002, 2003. In 2008, AFRICOM um, was established. And really, the, there was a counterterrorism uh, focus that was, that was ongoing, um, but also counter uh, piracy. If you remember the, um, you know, the, the age of the Somali pirates, um, that was, this, was a, this was a place where a lot of those operations uh, siphoned through. Um, fast forward to um, the events of um, Benghazi and uh, the American government, you know, recognized uh, post Benghazi in, in 2013 that we needed a way to respond to our embassies in crisis. Um, and the majority of the high risk, high threat uh, embassies in the world are in Africa. And we didn't have a way to to get here quickly to uh, answer the need of um, an embassy that was in trouble. And you saw that graphic in the beginning where it shows, you know, three continental United States fitting into the continent of Africa. And that is something that we're reminded of daily as we seek to support units um, downrange and how difficult it is to not only get to Africa, but to move people and things around Africa um, once, you're, once you're here. Even if you're flying uh, commercially, it is tremendously uh, difficult um, and onerous, and so so with that, uh, you know, Africom said, okay, we we have this this new normal um, operation that we're we're going to use to uh, be able to respond to an embassy in crisis. There's a group uh, response force um, th that is stationed in Europe that takes care of Northern Africa, and we have a group that's here that essentially has the rest of the continent. Um, and so it's it is our it is our number one no fail um, mission. Um, Twenty eighteen, there was a, a refocus um, at Africom. They they rewrote their um, campaign order. There was a, a, a focus of a, of the of the mission here at HOA to really um, drill down on the um, partners that were starting to arrive in the in the area, and so. Uh, what we have now, and, and they, these have arrived over over the years. Of course, we have the Djiboutians that have been here since the country's founding, uh, the French that have been here uh, for quite some time. It was a French uh, colony. We have the EU Navy here, who is is operating um, at a counter on a counter piracy um, mission. We have the Italians. We have the Spanish. We have a small uh, South Korean contingent. And then we have a you know a, a good sized uh, Japanese contingent um, as well, and so those are all the players in this very small area that's that's no larger than the state of uh, Massachusetts, um, all here. And then of course we have uh, the, the the PRC about five or six miles uh, up the up the road here with their um, PLA support base at uh, Dorley. Um, so it is. It is um, like you know the uh, the bar there in, in in Star Wars where you have anybody and everybody that is filtering through uh, Djibouti, um, and so 2020 to, to present, you know, our, our mission has has tweaked a little bit again with a new campaign plan, you know, by Africom. We're really cementing the 3Ds approach. Um, to our, our work on the continent, so defense and diplomacy and development. Um, and so through that, we work very, very closely with our, our U.S. Embassy here that has um, USA Mission Director and, um, uh, you know, very involved in what's happening here in Djibouti that gets after that, um, you know, number one line of effort, which is maintaining uh, strategic influence um, in the area. So we have um, we have qu quite the assembly of um, U.S. service members here. There, there are quite a few civilians here that support the operations of the base, which is run by the Navy. So it's kind of a unique circumstance where you have uh, a Navy captain who is the skipper of the base and runs all the life support for Camp Lemonnier. Uh, but then you have a, a two-star tenant that sits on the base 
Um, and so it makes for some some interesting uh, conversations um, over chow. Uh, but for the for the to the greatest extent, we are um, aligned and how we see our responsibilities and missions um, in the area. But our, our unit itself, most of the units we have are not um, OPCON to us. We have the ones that are OPCON to us are, we have a security forces uh, organization, we have air operations, we have engineers and a very small C-12 debt. Everybody else is in some sort of uh, take on type relationship or we are just literally supporting them as they move through uh, Djibouti and we you know we are I am the the number two senior officer on the continent and my boss is the senior um, military officer on the continent of Africa so all the things that that come with that um, responsibility um, but the unit itself here in the combined joint task force of so the C um, the combined part is uh, that we have uh, three three Brits um, and then we have some foreign liaison officers from all from all the uh, countries that I named just previously, um, and then the uh, the military members, um, the the National Guard will send out uh, a, a unit for the security forces, and then it sends out what what's called a maneuver enhancement brigade for the headquarters. Um, so right now we have New York as our sec four, and we have Wisconsin as our MEB. Um, and they are headed by each J staff section by an active duty colonel. So you have you have guardsmen that are you know the meat of the organization. You have active component directors. You have reservists. Uh, the the CG is a an army reservist. Of course, I'm a reservist. You have IAs that are active duty and come from all different components. It's largely army with some Air Force, some Navy, and just a couple of Marines. The uh, senior enlisted, the, the Sergeant Major of the task force is also a Marine, he's active duty. So it's it's nice to have someone on the command deck that we can uh, talk Navy lingo to each other. Um, so that's that's kind of who we are and, and what we're doing. It's principally right now facilitating operations all over the continent, especially in the east and to the south. Um, you know, we're, we're here um, as a as a security element for all American forces that come through and for ships that might do, uh, dock in Djibouti, we, we send um, a security element um, out there and we're here competing um, every day as soon as we go out the gates of the uh, of the base with all of our all of our friends um, in the in the local community. So, that's that's the quick um, overview, and I'm happy to start entertaining questions. Great, thank you very much, ma'am. Yeah. Uh, so, to the audience, I know there's already some questions in the chat. Please uh, feel free to keep putting those in there. To uh, the team crew, like folks who are in here on the um, on the audience as, as well, um, we'll we'll give you you know five star treatment. Um, if you want to raise your hand on WebEx, I'll go ahead and, and I'll I'll enable it so you can talk directly to you know our director and, uh, and get a chance to interact with her here after a few months of absence. But uh, before we get so, so throw up your hand um, and then I'll, I'll get to you. We'll do that part as well. But uh, initially, ma'am, so um, yeah, that, that was a good overview. And then uh, in the time you've been there, you know, you're talk, talking about facilitating operations on the continent. Um, what are some of the most sort of the, I don't know, the more memor most memorable or the most impactful operations that you've seen that you've either overseen or supported um, since you deployed over there in January? Yeah, so I had I had um, two sort of right off the bat. So you know, as as the DCG, um, you know, I'm I'm here so that the CG can uh, can do what she needs to do both here and uh, you know around the world quite quite literally. So and she travels a lot, which means I'm I'm the remain behind uh, OIC, if you will. And so just within a couple of weeks of me getting here was the uh, Al Sudani uh, raid, and I was. I was in the jock watching it happen live, um, you know, sort of blow by blow, if you will, you know, re reading the reading the sit reps come through. And uh, that was that was incredible to, to be there um, to watch that happen, you know, knowing who that guy was and, and what he had done um, and then how we did it and, you know, not not having any any uh, loss of life was amazing um you know minus the minus the dog bite 
Um, the second thing I got to do also within just a couple of weeks of getting here was was to go to the uh, support base, the Chinese support base at Dorale um, for the Chinese New Year. So um, I have a prop. I don't know if it will show up, but here here I am <laughs> with the deputy director of the of the Chinese support base, you know, giving me um, a, a commemorative plaque for my visit there. Um, and that was pretty overwhelming where they had representatives from all of the countries that are that are here. They had some high level Jibushans here or there. They had Chinese um, cultural displays ringing their auditorium. Um, and from the moment I stepped out of the car, um, you know, I was physically escorted and had somebody probably within two inches of me the entire time. I had a small party with me um, of, uh, of soldiers uh, and they, they were, you know, a little bit freer to kind of wander around and do their thing. Um, but the but the Chinese were just tripping over themselves, trying to show us all a really good time. Um, I had probably about 17,000 pictures taken of me, so I'm sure there's some, uh, I'm probably in some billboards somewhere and maybe have some TikTok videos that have been spoofed or something like that. I, I don't know, but literally, um, aside, even when I was eating, I had a thousand people come up to me and I'm using a little bit of hyperbole, but there were probably about a hundred Chinese there uh, and they were um, every single one of them wanted multiple pictures with me. Um, at the end of the night, they loaded us our, our two cars up with all kinds of gifts to include giant pandas and all kinds of things that we had to get scanned. Um, but they couldn't have been um, nicer and warmer and more receptive and wanted to ensure that they that we knew that they wanted us to hear that cooperation is win-win that was their message of the night cooperation is win-win so anyway that was within both of those events within a couple of weeks of me getting here and it was uh it was pretty surreal great ma'am so uh that, that leads into kind of the next big question i, I want to throw out there which is you know, understand that they want to put their best foot forward in a, you know, in an, an event like that when you're their guest, they're the yeah. host, et cetera. That cooperation is win-win. How, how have you seen that play out in practice, though, in, in the operations that you, you've seen here in the last few months? Like out, outside the wire for both sides, what is the relationship? What is the dynamic? Um, what, are, what are they doing um, in terms of cooperation or their version of cooperation in that area? Yeah, they, they, they spoke a really good game. They said, you know, we really want to do things um, with you. When can we come to your base to visit? You know, they, uh, they asked that repeatedly. Um, and they, they were interested in knowing, you know, what we could do together. And it, and it was, um, I don't know, I, I don't want to say it was disingenuous, but, but, you know, we knew that there were there, there's always an ulterior motive, right? Um, but in terms of our out in town um, interactions, you know, we, we have people go out on Liberty and, you know, there are two nice hotels here in Djibouti and they, they will, you know, run into um, soldiers from the PLL, PLA base. Um, and they, um, you know, I, I don't know if there um, there haven't been any incidents, you know, that I'm aware of, um, but we were at a, uh, a Japanese cultural night. And there was a good sized contingent from the Chinese base there. So it, it was it was wild to be there and just to be, you know, roaming around with our partners and allies. And then there are the there are the Chinese. So, again, they 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 come right up to you. They want to talk to you. They want to get their picture taken with you. And they ask, when can we come to your base to visit? So um, there hasn't been there's been, you know, a couple of, I guess, interactions, um, you know, uh, on, on a range or two when there was a you know miscommunication about who could be on what what range but but really they have just started coming out of their covid bubble um and so they're just now getting out and sort of saturating the area so things are things are picking up sort of week by week here very interesting ma'am and i i imagine yeah. uh, they're not going to be visiting the base anytime soon that would be my guess well we're trying to figure out a way uh to to uh to, to do something, um, you know, very low, low threat um, here. So I already told them, I said, your base is much nicer than our base. 
And that's the truth. It's very permanent. <laughs> Their base is very permanent. Very, uh, very, they put on a good show. Uh, let's, let's put you that way. Yeah, Ours is very, very active, still after 20 years. <laughs> right. And for both, both entities, I think there's a, there's a clear message behind the state of the base itself and what that means. So I'm going to start uh, going to the questions in the chat here. And then um, I see Dr. Tarz, you got your hand up. So I'm going to kind of yo-yo between the chat and, uh, um, and the Krulak staff here. We'll start off in the chat. And uh, first question, this kind of goes into the, uh, the, the Star Wars cantina uh, of people who are there that you laid out, ma'am. So the question is, if you could speak to some of the intricacies of the command relationships in and around the combined joint task force. And I, I can only imagine that there are, there are a thousand different relationships. Um, and I, it's especially interesting for historical reasons, kind of understand why there's a European presence there. Uh, you know, but for the South Koreans and the Japanese, um, what's their contribution to the mission of the Combined Joint Task Force overall and uh, along with the other entities there? So aside from our integrated staff, um, they are all, some are here because um, we're here. Many are here because, uh, and that's, that's, that's principally the case, I would say, for the, for the Japanese. Um, some are here because of the um, the counter uh, piracy mission that has now you know morphed into slightly uh, something slightly different, um, but they they understand the um, you know seagoing nations who are partners of the United States or allies of the United States understand the importance of this um, strait, and uh, you know the U.S. Navy. Um, you know, for a variety of reasons, isn't as present as as it used to be, and so it's it's all a very cooperative engagement area, and we train together when we can train together, especially when it comes to um, the French and the Djiboutians, um, because the of uh, of the special relationship that they have, you know, with this with this country that's you know much longer and and, and la uh, lasted longer than anything that that we have in terms of the security that it offers um, the Djiboutians. Um, and so we, we do quite a bit um, actually, you know, with the French. So they are not under the span of control of CJTFOA at all, but we understand for things like, say, you know, mutual defense that we all have an interest in, you know, if, if things go very badly one day here in Djibouti, that we're able to, you know, help each other out and, and ensure that, um, you know, we can share information, that we can talk to each other, and that we can provide assistance if necessary in the, in the event of, you know, some sort of event that would require that. All right, great, thank you, ma'am. Okay, Dr. Mm -hmm. Tarzi. Hello, ma'am, how are you? Good to see you. Hi. I, I would like to take you a little bit, you know, you named a lot of countries both from outside, you know, the Republic of Korea, Japan, China, and Europeans uh, and African partners, and, and uh, you didn't mention anyone from the Arab side, from the from the Sincom side of your, you know, you're looking at the North side. Uh, recently, there has been certain changes, dramatic changes. Uh, you know, the Chinese have been nice, but they have also been very diplomatically active, uh, bridging Saudi Arabia and Iran to it, something that would have been uh, not inconceivable, but but uh, it was it was in the, in the making, but the Chinese jumping in and solidifying that relationship, which most likely will lead to a major change in Yemen, uh, cessation of hostilities, uh, perhaps uh, an Iranian victory of a sort. Is that changing the whole perspective of the sea lanes going coming in from Bab al Mandab, going through the Red Sea, that now Saudi Arabia and Iran are potentially working together, and the UAE is kind of falling into its own, you know, they want to have their, their uh, pearl, you know, string of ports as they would. How do you see the short term impact of a China brokered Saudi Iranian UAE? We still don't know where this fall in this uh, impacting uh, US partnerships uh, and making sure that the northern side of that, that uh, place you're looking at is uh, we have a we have a say there because it's Saudis and lastly the Saudis have pretty much made it clear that while they are our partners they will not go against China or Russia on U.S. behest that's been pretty much made clear thank you very much 
Yeah, good, uh, good to see you even for a, a moment uh, too. I mean, um, that that um, you know negotiation and, and arrangements um, with Saudi Arabia and Iran, you know, have not you know played out explicitly here, and I would say yet. But what is abundantly clear to me is that we can never leave Djibouti. We can we can never leave this this um, area for that very reason. You know, the Russians are looking um, very closely at, you know, a port on the on the Red Sea. And if this whole area, you know, is contested from from the top to the bottom and everywhere in between, that has obviously significantly impacts um, significant impacts for us, um, you know, for the Europeans um, and, and the Africans them, themselves, too. So that is something that we will watch, you know, very, very closely. Um, and at the end of the day, you know, the, um, the, the Djiboutians will, will do what they feel um, is in their best interest. Um, so, you know, we, we have to uh, be very diplomatic with how we, we deal with them and in, in, in our interests and to uh, and to make sure that, um, you know, as a country, we don't take our eye off of um, this very strategic piece of, of ground here, because uh, especially with the war in Ukraine, you know, it's it's um, it's certainly uh, is tempting to to think the rest of the world will kind of hang on and take, take care of itself. Um, and, and when we don't have a U.S. presence here, you know, that lack of presence speaks volumes for what, you know, the rest of the world sees our American interests. And if, if we're not interested, you know, nature's going to fill a void and it's not going to be by who we want. So, um, so short, that is a long answer, but uh, no impact as of yet. But we, we, can't, we can't let it get um, any worse than it already is. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yep. All right. Great. Thank you, Dr. Tarzi. All right, so I'm going to go back to the chat, ma'am. And next question, um, kind of a couple questions I'll package together from Bazir Riot, and um, he's got a background as a crisis management expert, um, foresight practitioner, civilian. Um, been a regular uh, audience member here for this year, so great to to have you back and have some questions. Uh, he's asking if you've seen any, you know, not necessarily sort of, you know, not above board activities for your uh, your PRC neighbors there. And then, and then maybe maybe a related but separate question is, you know, one of the things that the uh, the PRC has been doing with, um, you know, it's one belt one road initiative is, um, it's not military presence but it's infrastructure. Um, and so, are are you seeing in in the AO there any specific, you know, Chinese telecom, um, other infrastructure investment and maintenance that are, you know, you know, one to help them establish presence, but two also, you know, are there is it an impact or a concern to what the Joint Task Force is doing? Yeah, um, 100%. I mean, you go out and you drive around, anything that looks new and shiny is Chinese. Chinese have been here for a while. They have built a brand new railroad um, to Ethiopia. Um, they have uh, renovated parts of the port. They have conference center. They have hotel. They're building apartments. Um, they haven't really done anything with the roads yet, which is anno annoying because they're they're pretty bad. Um, they they are absolutely everywhere. Um, they they do own some of the uh, the, the telecoms here, and they um, are are angling to, uh, to to get more. So yeah, they are absolutely everywhere here. Yeah, I haven't seen any. Um, well, you know, of course the they're. Djibouti, Djibouti is deeply in debt to them, um, and so there's um, they don't have a whole lot of leverage when it comes to you know what they what what they can push off or, or refuse to have done or built um, and, and what they can't. So um, that's just that's that's the pickle that they're in. They don't owe us um, anything, <laughs> so we don't. It's not the same. It's not the same dynamic. Sure. Thank you, ma'am. And uh, again, that's interesting parallel to who's building a permanent base and who's not um, and who what what they owe to who. So interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, next question, ma'am. So we, uh, Tank Colonel Zapata, uh, those in our audience, you know, he's been acting director since our, uh, our director has been overseas um, in Djibouti. So, uh, sir, you should be able to unmute yourself and go ahead and ask a question. 
Good day, ma'am. It's great to see you hey, again. Me too. And my question, I, I mean, I'm I'm hearing a lot of the uh, the things, whether it's through media or other other sources, and I'm just very curious in in what your perceptions are in terms of the actual, you know, competition uh, taking place that we may not hear about in the Western media. And I, I visualize there are some implications that are pretty, pretty high stakes that are not mainstream or not making it across uh, to, to the Western media or, or the uh, Western world. So just curious, uh, some of those insights that might be slipping through the cracks and, and what you're uh, hindsight is on those. Yeah, that's a great question. So I think one of the things that, that um, I was not aware of um, before coming out here and doing a little bit of deeper dive, you know, the, the PRC influence here and presence here in Africa and in, in Eastern and Southern Africa is not new. They've been here since the 1960s. Um, so this is, this is, you know, talking about playing the long game, they are definitely playing the long game. So I don't think that's something that, that, you know, most American school children um, are learning uh, if they learn anything about uh, Africa at all. Um, but I, I know it was in the media because I saw uh, an article or two about it, but it probably wasn't paid much attention. But um, maybe about six weeks ago, uh, it was announced that the Chinese signed um, at least a memorandum of understanding with the Djiboutians to build a $5 billion spaceport in the north of the country. Um, that, of course, um, yes, Djibouti can have its space program and, and, um, and all of that. Uh, principally, though, uh, you know, we know, I think we can all guess what, what it'll be, what it'll be used for. They'll be able to launch satellites, but also do a whole bunch of uh, other things. So, you know, we're, we're obviously very concerned about that. And then also concerned about, you know, how they build it, who they build it with and, you know, what the presence is going to be, you know, in the country of um, what will inevitably be, uh, you know, uh, Chinese labor, um, you know, coming in. So that the, those are probably two big things that, um, you know, I think were, were pretty shocking that probably got next to next to no uh, press um, back in the States. Thank you, ma'am. All right. Thank you, ma'am. And again, uh, to the audience. Um, OK, another question here from the chat um, asking uh, if you could maybe expand on your relationship with the Department of State uh, for where you're operating. How what, what's the nature of that relationship? Um, how much do you work together um, and who sort of the, are, are they the I take it they would probably be the lead role. Um, uh, but what are what are the sort of the operations that you're undertaking in collaboration with them? Yeah, so so um, I know you read it in my bio, but you know, as a young lieutenant, um, my first deployment, I was actually working out of the U.S. Embassy in uh, in Lima, Peru, and so I was exposed to our interagency uh, partners then, and saw you know a version of how um, you know Americans operate overseas in defense with uh, you know three letter agencies and with with uh, Department of State and all that. Um, then, of course, I had my own, you know, interactions with um, Department of State and interagency in Afghanistan. And then here um, in Djibouti, I can say that it, I have never seen it any better. I can't I haven't seen a tighter relationship um, with our Department of State, you know, USAID uh, colleagues that are just down the road um, in the embassy. Um, we, you know, we meet. Uh, uh, every couple of weeks uh, um, and, and have, um, you know, roundtable discussions. Members of our staff are always over at the embassy uh, interacting on various, um, you know, initiatives, usually centered around the 3Ds, you know, uh, concept. So, you know, the, the State Department obviously has the diplomacy lead. And so much of what we do, I, I mean, bottom line is it's fantastic. Um, they're also very supportive. Um, of our operations, um, you know, when we have, you know, any type of, of incident and we need to notify the Djiboutians of, you know, a mishap or, or, you know, planned operation, whatever it is, like they, they are, you know, Johnny on the spot, if you will, in terms of, you know, how we can reach them and when we can reach them and, and uh, the whole messaging aspect. So 
uh, it's it's really been a, a really gratifying experience uh, with them here. All right, great, thank you, ma'am. Okay, I guess uh, continuing with that, well, I'm, I'm gonna leave for our questions here uh, real quick. In terms of uh, the Civil Affairs Division that's assigned under the Joint Task Force, uh, what are the work that they do in terms of supporting both, you know, U.S. State Department, um, U.S. AID, as well as the task forces operations in that area and throughout the continent? The Comrail discussion, um, I, I kind of just alluded to, but the Civil Affairs actually um, fall under uh, CTAF up in uh, Army Africa, up in up in Europe. Um, and so they they are they operate in this AO and we have a coordinating um, type relationship with them. So if they have spare capacity, they, they reside. They have um, a team here on the on the camp itself. Um, but they they essentially operate out of out of uh, Camp Lemine and, and go to other places in East and Southern um, Africa. With their spare capacity, they do have a team that that is, um, you know, looking at CMO uh, uh, in Djibouti itself. Um, they use a lot of ODACA funding to uh, to do local projects. Um, you know, re, you know, I guess not too long ago there was a a school project uh, with the library and. Um, you know, the Japanese bought the books and, you know, the, the U.S. actually, you know, built the library annex and and they coordinated all of that. And then we went out for the for the opening and the, the CG read a story. You know, it was it was a nice uh, it was a nice event, nice photo op. But um, something that's important that I think on the competition scale uh, that that where we can beat the, the PRC all day, every day uh, and and Wagner itself. Um, is English language. So English is, and for the foreseeable future will remain the language of business. Um, and so it's to the, you know, Djiboutians um, advantage to learn English. And, you know, it is, it is um, not very prevalent here. There are some that understand English, but through a lot of the civil affairs projects, um, in addition to stuff they've been doing at the, um, the hospital, um, they, they've had a lot of English language projects and labs that they set, they set up and, and working groups where it's all about uh, teaching English, which I think is likely one of our greatest weapons now. Great. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, so next couple of questions. Um, I think this kind of ties into some of the, uh, um, you know, enforcement and countering of, of illegal operations where, you know, okay. counter piracy is one aspect of that. But our, our Bazir, he, he knows there's some other you know, things that do go on um, on the African continent. Do you have any any cooperation or any any enforcement partnership in terms of things like trading of illegal wildlife or exportation of rare earth minerals? Um, I would imagine we're, I, I'm speculating, but I would imagine I know that rare earth minerals, you know, one, Africa has a, a fair amount of it as a resource and two, China wants it, um, wants it to uh, because that's what feeds into in everything from, you know, hybrid car batteries to microchips and processors and other things. So is there a, I don't know if, is there an enforcement arm or a collaboration in enforcement against um, illicit trafficking and some of these things? Uh, not, not for, not for us, but many times we're the, we're the waypoint. So we've had things transit through here that have been, um, uh, you know, captured off of ships uh, from the CENTCOM AO uh, typically. Um, and I, I can't remember things that have come in through the through the continent out of Djibouti. Um, you know, typically they would fly out of uh, you know whatever airport that they're closest to um, back to the United States for for exploitation. Um, so so we don't have too much uh, of a role other than facilitating supporting the groups that might be receiving those goods. I'll call them and their their onward uh, their onward mobility from here. Great, thank you, ma'am. Uh, I'll throw one last thing out there, maybe comment on, and then we can look at uh, and wrap it up and realizing it's evening time, we're not gonna stretch this out longer than we have to. Um, but in, in the time you've been there and what you've seen, ma'am, uh, what what's the greatest challenge that the, the task force is, try, is trying to deal with in terms of your five different lines of operation or the 3Ds? Um, and is it the same challenge that the diplomatic presence has to deal with? Um, or are there some, is there a unique challenge that the task force itself is working through? 
Yeah, I mean, we're we're an economy of force um, uh, mission here. You know, I I wish, and I think all the Americans here wish that we could get Americans back home to care more about this area um, of the world and to see its um, strategic importance. You know, one of the I didn't talk about it yet, but but the largest group that we support here, the you know other components inside Africom is uh, SOCAF you know, in, the, in their counter VEO mission um, in Somalia. And what we're, what we're able to do to uh, enable that um, support, you know, has, has global um, effect. So, you know, that's just, that's just one of the things that, that, um, that in this format, I can't talk about you know, too many of the details, uh, but, but I wish that, that we were able to share more of that, more of that story you know, with the American people, but also the importance of our presence here, um, really shoulder to shoulder with, um, you know, the only at this point um, PRC base outside of mainland China, um, and and to that significance in this area of the world, you know, on this key maritime <laughs> terrain, there just are a lot of things. Um, you know, I, I I wish that we had you know more of a focus. On this area of the world, and that we, uh, you know, nationally could really capitalize on uh, who we are and where we're situated. I right, agree. Thank you, ma'am. And uh, if, if you can actually indulge us here for a second, I got one last question here from Albert Lee. I think he uh, he came on late, but it, I think it, it's a it's actually a pretty important area that he's talking about here. So we'll make this the last question, and then we'll wrap things up. But. Uh, his question notes that the so UN Secretary General has said that Somalia suffers the effects of a climate crisis that it itself did not cause. What have you seen in terms of the, you know, the impact of uh, climate change in that region? Uh, and, and is there anything being taken from what you're seeing to inform, you know, both future Marine Corps operations, but also, you know, across the DOD and, you know, the, the joint force uh, in areas that are in increasingly potentially impacted by the effects of climate change? So for Somalia, they've they've had this uh, this ongoing um, drought, of course, and you know, ongoing war, and you know, ongoing operations um, against uh, Al Shabaab that that take away, um, you know, a lot of the fi the fighting age males, if you if you will. So it is and continues to be a perfect storm for the exploitation of a people that are are starving and don't have access to health care, education, water, all good governance, all those things that that create a fertile recruiting ground for um, for terrorist organizations. Um, it makes it hard for the government to deal with m what what might be um, mitigating factors for climate change when you're when you're trying to just, you know, es establish good governance in the in the country itself. So it's sort of chicken and egg, first things first, but while you've got a, uh, a, a very large and well-funded terrorist organization in your country um, that's exploiting your people, um, you know, that's that's what needs to get uh, taken care of first. Um, in terms of future Marine Corps operations and how, you know, the applicability, I'll just, I'll just zoom that out to sort of all of Africa. So the, the organization, um, that's take on here from MAR4F is the ACE, the Air Combat Element, um, long long ago residue of the SP MAGTAF. The only thing that remains, but the only thing that makes this you know operations in, in this theater possible because of the the uh, size and span of Africa and what we're asked to support. So the V22, the MV22 with uh, C-130 combination allows us to reach most of, of the continent um, of Africa. And the way they do that is flying from, you know, airfield to airfield, you know, across vast distances. Um, and so it's, it's actually, um, it's, a, it's a great uh, opportunity for the ACE to not only, you know, give their pilots um, a lot of experience but to prove some of the concepts of uh, of force design and, and um, EABO, except it's over it's over land. It's actually it's pretty impressive um, what the Marines do. They are, you know, not unlike the Army in other places. The Army comes in very heavy, 
and they have um, you know some some redundancy built into their formations. But that ace comes out here, and they uh, they put their heads down. They're out on that flight line. They're flying. They're turning wrenches. They're working and they're sleeping and they're eating. And that's about all they're doing. And because of them, you know, this combined joint task force can do what it needs to do. So, um, you know, for, there was some consternation about that mission for a long time because of, um, you know, the, the Marine Corps needs those assets and other, and other theaters, but really for the, this contribution to the joint force really makes the, uh, the J possible in this joint task force. So, um, makes me really proud to wear the Eagle, Eagle Globe and Anchor around this uh, camp. That's for sure. Thank you, ma'am. And, you know, I always love to hear about how great the ACE is, so you don't have to convince me. You know, I'm, I know. We're, Man, we're, I've never loved the ACE more. <laughs> All right. And we, we might with have them to, twice before, like you said. Yeah, maybe we'll have to have a little 3D printed Osprey waiting for you in the office when you get back. Um, oh, or maybe we, can, maybe we can send it out. Okay. Um, yeah, so we're, we'll end the questions there. Um, any final thoughts or comments, ma'am, you'd like to share before we um, end our time here? Um, I, I appreciate everybody uh, dialing in. And um, for those that will um, listen to this uh, a, as a recording, you know, I, I think just take the time to uh, to do some research on what's going on uh, in Africa, in East Africa, especially because, you know, there are, there are always going to be Americans that wonder, you know, like, why do we have um, Americans in uh, in harm's way over there in East Africa, and you need to you need to be able to explain why. And I'll tell you, it's um it's important for the homeland. Um, you know, as everyone will tell you, um, in the military, we like to play away games, and what we're doing here makes it so. Um, if uh, if we have to, we can play um, an away game against uh, against any threat, um, and it's important to our our partners and allies. Um, who, um, thanks to Putin's war in uh, Ukraine, you know, understand that none of us will uh, will conquer evil on our own, and that includes the United States. And so, what we're doing here um, definitely reinforces that. So, um, appreciate everybody's time, and it's been uh, it's been a real pleasure. All right, great. Thank you very much, ma'am. And uh, to, yes, to echo that. Thanks to our audience for joining us today. Um, we'll make sure uh, I've got couple episodes from this week. So I'll probably package those and post them all together. So make sure you're following us on either our email, distro or social media for when this episode finally gets up on our YouTube channel and podcast channels. And uh, we, we do have a lot more coming here in the next few weeks, too many to list. So just make sure you're following us on those as well. So you don't miss any uh, future broadcast episodes. All right, ma'am, General Jackson, again, uh, great to see you again. Um, sounds like you things too. are going great out there and uh, you know, good luck with uh, the rest of your time out there. But we definitely look forward to having you back here at the Kulak Center here uh, in the summertime. Uh, but until then. Yeah, won't be long. Yes, ma'am. Again, audience, thank you. Ma'am, thank you. And we'll see you all in the next one. Thanks for joining us. As always, we depend on support and feedback from the Team Kulak community to constantly improve our offerings and reach a wider audience. So if you have feedback on this episode, please take a moment to fill out the survey linked in the show notes to help us do better. Also, if you enjoyed this episode, please hit the like button and subscribe to our channel on YouTube or leave us a review on the podcast app of your choice. It truly does help us reach a wider audience. Thank you as always for your support, and we'll see you on the next episode. Education is what's important. Training, preparation for the expected. Education, preparation for the unexpected.